Phil, are you on the phone with us? I am here, brother. How are you guys today? Doing fantastic. How was your weekend? It was good, man. We got some work done. I've uh, got some some yard work and deck work and stuff that we've been putting off for a while. So we're we're climbing slowly into summer. Are you not? Uh, were you not on the volleyball uh, courts this weekend? Uh, no, there's a there's a little bit of a break for uh, Ada and myself, and that we'll we'll go back. We'll we'll go back to practice. Soon, but the next tournament isn't until late June, early July in Chicago. So you're doing the honey do list? Is that is that what your weekend? I'm, I'm with? doing the honey do list that I have put off for uh, decades, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Phil, what did you think about that introduction that we played for you this morning? Well, man, I don't know. I heard that I, I didn't hear it. So I heard I was the introduction, and if it is what I think it it's is... It's exactly what you think it is. Absolutely. <laughs> why, why didn't you... That's our, yeah, we... we that's we, AI. That's yeah. not me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, we, we told you we were going to play it for you. Why didn't you listen to it, Phil? What were you doing? Well, I was I was rushing around getting ready, and then Colin said, "Hey, did you hear the introductory?" And as soon as he said that, my head just kind of dropped a little bit. So, so I'd like to just tell how many horses, horses have you licked it. this week? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was artificial intelligence. That is not me. That was someone else pretending to be me or a robot pretending to be me. But to answer that question is only two. <laughs> you know, Phil, you're ready for politics. You you pull your AI out of your pocket very quickly. So. Yes, yes, I'm thinking that's a good that's a good plan for a lot of look. If you said something three years ago that doesn't align with what you're saying now, just say it was artificial intelligence. It was AI before we knew what AI was. So, Phil, speaking about AI, how how is AI affecting the markets, or have the computers already kind of taken that over years ago? And well, that's a good question, and it's it's unknown. You know, what I, from from my standpoint here on the street, one, you know, from an individual company standpoint, some of those that are believe that we'll do better in AI or pick up on it quicker, their stock will probably prosper for a short period until everyone catches up. But, you know, from the standpoint of security, that's where kind of my concern, my focus this is a very micro example. I don't know if a lot of planners, I imagine they do share the same sentiment, but the ability to mimic someone's voice scares me to death. I know you could have done that to, to an extent in if you had some some equipment to do so, but it seems now as if uh, anyone can go on, and it's not that difficult, and that kind of worries me a little bit, just from the standpoint of people, you know, we're, we're personal advisors, so when people call, we recognize voices, and, you know, whether it's distribution or a question or whatever it may be, we recognize those voices, and, and typically that is the way that we identify, yep, this is the right person. And now with this artificial intelligence, it just scares me. And I don't know that we're there quite yet, but, man, this thing is moving fast. And Dude. just over the weekend, you, know, you ask how my weekend went, but just over the weekend, you know, I was scrolling through the Internet, and I saw uh, dozens of apps for AI, and I don't even know if they cost anything. I wasn't interested, but it just makes me a little nervous that it, people could do that and, and without very little ability. And, you know, I'm sure that people that have the ability to, to mess with audio could have done it to some extent in the past. But it, it just free, just puts me a bit. What about what about the actual market? Are are there computers making decisions to buy and sell stocks? Well there's yes, there is, and there's always kind of been computers that, that are doing that. And if you think of a mutual fund or if you if you open up a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund or any type of platform, even think of a life cycle fund. When some of those asset classes get out of range from what you have preset, it would be an automated uh, sell or a buy in order to put it back in order. But I think that the artificial intelligence is going to a different level. Now, to this, to, uh, up to this moment, I think if you ask AI, hey, what stock should I buy? I don't think it would give you an answer. I think, you know, it's no different if what team should I bet on in the upcoming football game or basketball game or whatever it may be. It wouldn't give you an opinion, but th that has been a factor in automatic trading and selling and buying. 
for quite some time, but it was preset. Hey, we're going to do this. We even use it to a small extent in our office. Like, hey, look, if this gets too uh, too heavy or too light in one certain asset class or investment, that it would automatically buy or sell that. Or, you know, think of uh, uh, limits and set and stops on individual stock sales. That's kind of AI. You know, you put it, you put an order in in advance, and if it hits that price, it's going to trigger a buy or sell. But this is kind of a different level. I hope. Uh, my hope is, and I don't know that I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm hoping that people don't start taking the advice of a computer because that could lead. That, that computer has no idea what each individual's uh, circumstance is and what led up to, you know, buy this or sell that. Yeah, Phil, uh, taking this one step farther, uh, what concerns me is a combination of AI and the ability to hack into a system such as our market. Uh, I'm confident precautions have been taken, but are there sufficient precautions? Because there could be a lot of damage done, a lot of mischief done, if they have built it to hack and then introduce AI. Yeah, and, and like you, I, I, I hope that, one, it's on an individual human basis that we don't see something that triggers us to buy or sell based off of what that AI has done. So from a human standpoint, that's the first line of defense is as an individual or as a planner, you don't see something without vetting what you're seeing. And I don't know that that part has changed. We all need to vet what we see now, especially, you know, with the media sources and skimming headlines. I'm as guilty as the next person where that headline may say something that the article doesn't say and we just move on with the headline and, and take that to be the full, full fact or full truth. But it's the same thing with AI. So if something were to be hacked or a president's voice or a foreign minister's voice or something, a Jamie Dimon's voice or Elon Musk's voice that says this, that, or the other, hopefully we now take that with a grain of salt and we need to bet that that is actuality instead of artificial intelligence doing that to us or some sort of hacker scheme. Seems to me the genie's already out of the bottle on this. I worry less about the interaction with individual planners and dealing with AI. It's the fund managers who represent, you know, a gajillion different stocks. And I see it easily see a time where those decisions, if 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 this stock gets to this point, above this point or below this point, then we're gonna sell or we're gonna buy. And that would be easily spun out of control, I would I would think. And that's 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 where my concern is, is is at that level where one guy, one one fund manager, one fund man, fund management team, is making decisions for thousands, tens of thousands of investors, and representing hundreds of different stocks. Yeah, and that's that's kind of been there before, and and this wasn't done at the fund level, but it was done. It, it kind of looked at like it was from a from a distance. But remember the GameStop and the Reddit craze that caused GameStop, and I think it was the AMC for that price to go insane. And, and I think that's kind of the fear that you're looking at is where one person, one fund, one group, one company can buy or sell an individual equity to make it look less or more attractive, thus causing everyone else to do it. And that's kind of what happened with the GameStop. So that fear's always been there. I just think now it's exaggerated a bit because of the voice stuff is really what freaks me out, is to be honest with you. The whole voice thing. You know, I think we, we've conditioned ourselves to see things in print and kind of question it and want to bet it before we believe it, especially before you go playing with your money uh, because of it. But the voice thing, for the most part, for most of us, we're not familiar with that. And when we have seen fake voices you knew that they were fake you knew it was so you know how how do you vet that and and i don't i don't know i don't know the answer to that but shortly uh, see, soon here hopefully we find a way that we can say look that's that's not accurate that's not real maybe it's seeing their face and their lips at the same time i don't know if AI i can do that or not probably but i can you, you know yeah. it, it, man it just seems so easy to do though you know as i as i play through and I'm not, I'm, I'm anything but a, a technology master, but I think I could have downloaded an app and got someone's voice and made it say something. And that's scary to me. So uh, 
hopefully the Fed has raised the interest rates for the last time. Uh, looking forward, what do you see for the uh, markets this week? What, what's the big news, Phil? Well, I'll re I'm going to rephrase what you said. Hopefully, they don't have a reason to right. raise rates anymore. That's in the and and, I'm, and I, I think at least the pauses in order and to see all that they have done up to this point has it been enough and that's the big question that we don't know and it is a very confusing time now we have reverted back some to where good news could be good news again and when companies make money we actually pay attention to it again and i find that to be a positive sign but if you know th this this idea target to get down to two percent right now where i think the last one was at 4.9 or something like that that's going to be difficult because there's this sticky part of inflation that the federal reserve even brought up in in august of last year which caught when he said that, that our economy is going to need to see some pain our, our markets reacted immediately but that the sticky part of inflation is wage inflation and in a vacuum and I, I have I have entry level workers in my house and by entry level I mean like part time job or summer jobs or or I'm just kind of doing it to do it entry and exit level positions those that have have retired or are nearing retirement that are kind of transitioning not really working because they have to but working because they want to and and you know you throw into that like a, a 17 year old a 16 year old that's working at, at an ice cream stand and they're doing it for pocket money. It's not that they have to, they just want pocket money and the parents want to teach them some type of, 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 of responsibility with money and the value of money. But now that you look at how much that worker is demanding and it, man, it's severe, it's steep and, and in a vacuum, it's really good. But on an overall basis, it is part of this wage narrative or this inflation narrative is wage inflation. And that is going to be the difficult and painful part in order for us to get down to that target. What in my own little mind, what I wonder is, is if we can get down to, say, 3 percent or close to it and our, and our employment market still looks good like it does now, if we just don't say, OK, that's good enough, let's change our target into 3% instead of 2% because we still have a healthy employment market and inflation is at least manageable at 3%. It's not at 5%. It's still high. It's much better than what it was, but it's at least manageable and we have accomplished that without completely ruining the employment market. I wonder if that, if that situation could present itself in Jerome Powell. So, yep, okay, this is good enough. But right now I think a pause is in order unless we see some type of consumer demand, consumer strength, or, uh, you know, and, and gas, we always talk about gas. Gas prices going up could be another issue going into the summer. But right now what I think is that a pause is in order and maybe even until the late fall before there's another decision made to move one way or the other. Phil, uh, many of us that invest take the long-term view, but we have to... Bill, you sound like you're down the road. I can't hear you. Yeah, well. maybe. Okay, try it again. Okay, Mike is working the board, and I'm not sure we... Okay. <laughs> it, it's called trying to work the board. It, it, it is a failing option, but we got you on, Bill. Okay. Uh, Phil, a lot of us, as we invest, take the long-term view, but we have to be conscious of the short-term impact. As you provide advice uh, to your uh, to your clients, how much of the recent pressure points are you in, are you including as you provide your uh, your suggestions? Well, our suggestions, the, the step step number one for us, and hopefully any planner, because it's the prudent move, is to look at your individual financial position. So we want to see where you are, what your goals, what do you have, what are you trying to accomplish with what you have, and then we're going to set an asset allocation. And by that, I mean how much stock or equity exposure do you have? That's the stuff that we always talk about, and it always gives us heartburn, but it's also the same stuff that makes us money in the long run and beats inflation. How much bond and cash exposure do you have? Now, the bonds, of course, we saw last year, bonds have downside exposure as well. They can drop in value, but that floor should be a little bit higher than what it is with equities, as is the ceiling. It's a little bit lower than what it is with equity. So not as much volatility with bonds 
And then how much cash do you need to hold? What, what expenses do you have coming up? What do you need to live off of? Do you have any big purchases or goals by paying for a wedding and so forth? All of those things are the main focus, regardless of what the markets are doing. And we put that into place and we deal with whatever happens. So if you are someone that we say, look, you, it's appropriate to have 55% equities and 40% bonds and then the rest in, in cash or some sort of cash investment like CD or, or flex savings certificate or something along those lines. And whatever may happen, we're built for that. And then, then the long term we're looking at so that no short term volatility can knock you off course. And that is the most important thing because we acknowledge we don't we have no idea what's going to happen. If you would have told me back in twenty twenty or early twenty twenty anyway, that COVID would have the impact that it had. And then again in April that by the end of the year, and I still remember saying this and I said it publicly and I wish I hadn't, but Back in 2020, J.P. Morgan Chase said, I think the S&P will recover fully by the end of the year. And that was in August or April of 2020. And I said it, that was an irresponsible thing for someone, a market mover or someone with clout to say publicly. And I'd be daggone if they weren't right. And I thought it was ridiculous. I thought the fact that they would say that was absolutely ridiculous, but they were right in then some. So we acknowledge that we don't know what's going to happen. Because of that, we have to be built to withstand any any downfalls that we see in the short term so that it doesn't interfere with what your wants, wishes, needs, and goals are. And the, but the main thing is that overall asset allocation. If you're looking at someone that's not going to touch this money for the next 40 years, then it doesn't matter what the next few months bring. If you're looking at someone that's pulling two grand a month or three grand a month off of their portfolio, well, then it does matter. So that would be the portion that we would have in short duration bonds and or cash. And so that cash flow isn't interrupted. And then the other parts of it can still grow because it's on the back burner. It's up to bat. It's not it's not first in order, but it may be seventh, eighth and ninth in order. So that's okay. We can let that grow. We can deal with the short term bumps. And that's how those portfolios are built. And it is a question and that it's difficult sometimes not to pacify people uh, because they, they have a short term concern. But when, in reality, we don't really care about the short term. We talk about it every day, but we don't really care in reality when, when push comes to shove and we're looking at someone's uh, personal situation. We're looking at the remainder of their life and, and what they need in, within the next six to 12 months or is there any huge expenses coming up next year we may go ahead and pull it you know if we've had a good a, a good run in the markets and we say hey you know what these equity positions up about 20 percent we know that you have to pay for a wedding next year or you have to buy a car or you got tuition coming up let's go ahead and move that over to the cash portion and let it sit there and wait so that it's not in danger so to answer your question it is really boring but it's very disciplined that we're looking at an asset allocation for that particular individual almost never would we say that someone should change what their allocation is based off the current market going back to to the inflation thing um if, if, hypothetically, if we could find a rare moment of unity in, in the Congress and we were to claw back the hundreds of billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars in unspent COVID cash, you know, the stuff that's been appropriated but not yet spent, does that solve our problem? Is it is it that simple and that, obviously that difficult? you got to find the agreement. But I, would that make the difference? That no, because I still I, I don't think it would. I don't know that, but I don't think that it would. Because our biggest issue right now, outside of you know the, this this vacuum that I keep talking about, is wage inflation. It, it is a problem for everyone except for that individual that's getting paid so much more now than what they were pre-COVID. That's the problem. You know, if I'm building widgets and pre-COVID I had I could pay someone ten bucks to help me build that widget, but now it has to be sixteen or seventeen in order to get them to come in and work and the competition is also paying, you know, bonuses or work when you want or work from home and all these different things, then that is the underlier, the sticky part of inflation that we need to bust through, at least to some extent. So I don't know that, that the other the other part would certainly help, but I think the hard part to get through 
is that wage inflation that we're that we're dealing with right now. But the the Fed doesn't have that string to pull, does it? I mean, raising raising rates is not going to do anything to affect inflation of, of wages. Oh yeah, raising weight, rates it, it does because if you raise rates, it's going to discourage spending. And if people aren't spending, I don't need to build as many widgets. And if I don't need to build as many widgets, then those people are going to get laid off. And that's the pain that Jerome Powell was talking about. And it's hard to say that, but that is kind of what they're looking for, is for for layoffs to happen and unemployment rates to come back up. So then when, the, when demand outweighs supply again and I have to bring more people in, then I can bring them in at a lower rate. But the competition for wages right now on entry and exit level positions are are higher than, so much higher than what they were pre-COVID. And those so wage, that, that wage inflation never goes down, down, correct? I mean, it'll so just... It goes down if... You, no, you, would, have, you would have to have unemployment like crazy. Yes, yes. That's the pain that, that exactly, that's the pain that uh, Jerome Powell's talking about. And what, I think what they're hoping is they can be surgical with that and by surgical i mean and then I'm, I'm telling you this isn't a popular thing to say but this is exactly what they're focused on is by surgical i mean those entry and exit level positions that say look okay well if phil's daughters lose their jobs or they don't need them anymore or they can they can reduce their wages because if they lose them then what's the big deal then that necessarily doesn't hurt our economy it hurts it if it happens to them when they're 35 and 40 and they're trying to raise a family but entry and exit level positions aren't what kind of drive this country. But right now it is what is driving prices up. And you can look anywhere and see it. Now, some of that has come down. The unemployment rates, for a moment anyway, kicked up for just a second. So what they're trying to accomplish is can we accomplish this surgically? So unemployment rates will tick up a little bit but not get terrible. And there goes that soft landing that's so hard to achieve. And they're, they're getting criticized right now for going too far in rates. But from their standpoint, they're saying, well, how can you say we've gone too far increasing rates because our, our employment market still looks so good and consumer demand is still fairly strong. And that can be a good thing if inflation continues to come down. But I think what they know lying underneath is that it's only going to get to a point if wages stay where they are right now. Inflation can be viewed from two perspectives. One from the from a national inflation, that's what we resonate with, but also there's global inflation as well. Relative to many countries, our inflation is very, very, very modest. Uh, when the Fed make their decision, how much do they take into account the global as opposed to just the U.S.? I don't know that they take into account much at all other than uh, possibly what we could be paying to bring in things that we can't create ourselves. I don't think they pay that much attention to it at all. What they're most concerned about is their own inflation, and it t typically countries will follow us instead of us following them. So I don't, I don't think that they pay much attention to it at all. They, they say that they focus on uh, uh, the PCE numbers, which is the last of the inflation number to come out, and that's personal consumption, and, and that is here in the United States. It's not global, but it is the last number to come out, but we kind of know what that is based off the CPI and the PPI, so there's three major inflation reports, and we kind of know what the PCE is based off of that, and those are all strictly here in the United States. It seems to, it seems to me that the the price to pay is it sort of outstrips the benefit. If we declare, and again, it, it's I, I know this is kind of a rookie question, but if we declare five percent inflation to be okay for the short term, and we don't create massive unemployment because all those unemployed people are going to go on the public dole, so you know none of none of this is free. It seems to me that that there comes a point we say, okay, two percent is is not achievable. We'll live with five for now and and not continue to change rates and not inflict the pain am i being naive here because i got to tell you having massive uh, unemployment is 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 worse than having the inflation i think well and here's here's where they and i think we agreed to some extent remember about 15 minutes ago i said i wonder if they would get to three percent five percent may be a little heavy to accept on a long-term basis i don't know that three percent would so if you could achieve that 
three percent and not five percent and I, I don't know which is more difficult now from the federal reserve standpoint what i think they think and it's hard to tell because they have to be really careful with telling us what they think but because we, we overreact to it but what i think they think is it's better to go too far than not far enough it's easier to cut rates and think back to april of 2020 than it is to tame runaway inflation think back to the late 70s early 80s so it's much easier to say okay we went too far let's cut rates we went too far unemployment rates are too high let's cut rates encourage spending encourage spending because they know the consumer if people are spending money and then demand is very high then we'll have to bring people back in and that's going to help the employment market so i don't know that i fully agree of the worst of the evils is more than in my opinion is runaway inflation opposed to higher unemployment rates because i think the federal reserve believes that that's an easier fix phil thanks for joining us today i really appreciate it. how can people get a hold of you and where can they find you you can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. And you will not be licking any horses, correct? No more. No, no more. No, no more. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Appreciate it. Thank you guys for making that the intro. <laughs> <laughs> and the outro. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Have Phil. a good one, Phil. Take care.